mentioned that uh, Betty and I will be leaving for uh, Ludington after tonight's service. Uh, so we're going on our week vacation. Ben's preaching next Sunday morning. Right, Ben? <laughs> and then Jake next Sunday night. Yep. I get, I get a few of them now. Um, yeah, we are waiting. We're actually going back home to finish up packing. Our goal was to leave right after, um, but we, were, we stayed too long eating those nourishing cupcakes uh, today. <laughs> The title of our lesson tonight is Unclean. Unclean. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 5. The Bible says, quote, No unclean person has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So no unclean person has any inheritance in heaven. And no, it's not talking about dirt on your hands. I thought it was a good picture to illustrate the point, but uh, tonight I want to focus on uh, that word unclean in Scripture. And I want all of us to leave here certain tonight that we do not fall into this category of being unclean so that any of us were to miss out on heaven. And we understand this. Uh, If you look this word up in a concordance or a Bible dictionary, uh, the first category you will find in Scripture is the Old Testament usage of the word for unclean. Point number one of this lesson I've titled, Unclean, as used often in the Old Testament. Uh, So now remember, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, explains to us that the old law was simply a shadow of good things to come. Uh, That is, many of the concepts in the Old Testament were simply pointing forward to what God would later reveal in the New Testament. Uh, we study this concept of type type and antitype in Scripture, which is pretty much symbolism in the Old Testament, which represents something that would be coming in the New. Uh, it was foreshadowing, or a hint at what was coming, helping us to understand the concepts that God would later reveal. Uh, for example, God wanted the world to understand the concept of Jesus shedding his blood on the cross, as an innocent stand-in sacrifice for the guilty. All right, someone innocent would die for the guilty, and the sin would be transferred onto this innocent sacrifice where his life would be offered on the guilty's behalf, thus setting the guilty free. So what process did God set up first in the Old Testament? Animal sacrifices, right? The Jews learned this concept Uh, through God's Old Testament command for animal sacrifices as atonement for sin. Uh, What God was showing them was the principle uh, that their guilt required the shedding of blood. And God would provide a substitute so that the guilty wouldn't have to suffer their rightful death for their own sin. So the animal sacrifices were the type. Jesus Christ's sacrifice was the antitype. So you see the idea of symbolism between the two testaments that God set up to teach us. You also see this at play uh, when God established uh, the Old Testament high priest who would conduct this sacrifice and the sacrifices. The The high priest was the one who would present the animal sacrifice before God, and God would overlook the sins of the people. You come to the New Testament, and Jesus is called our what? Well, he's called our high priest. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 and 12 says, But Christ came as high priest not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place, which we study as heaven. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So the high priest's position in the Old Testament was a type. Jesus is the antitype in what he would come to do. Uh, We have a high priest who presented a blood sacrifice before the Father, not of goats and calves, but with his own blood he came. Uh, God set all these things up in the Old Testament beforehand, so that when Jesus came on the scene to do his atoning work, the world would be able to receive these concepts. He didn't just try to drop all of this down at once. Uh, the foreshadowing was also at play in the tabernacle, the house of God in the Old Testament, foreshadowing the house of God in the New Testament, which is the church. Right? All sorts of symbolism that God set up so that mankind would be able to receive Jesus' covenant when he came. Uh, The Old Testament laid the groundwork, I guess you could say. So for the first point tonight, uh, I want you to think about this concept. We're going to study tonight how uh, God helped the Jews to understand the concept of uncleanness. 
by teaching them through physical impurities. Then in the New Testament, mankind would be able to apply this concept to spiritual impurities, which is really what God wanted mankind to understand the whole time while talking about uncleanness. So let's look at the Old Testament emphasis on uncleanness uh, as really being a very physical uh, concept in the Old Testament. Right? The Jews trying not to defile their outward man, that is, their flesh. Uh, first, Leviticus chapter 11, uh, of course, gives a list of animals that the Jews were not allowed to eat of. Uh, this chapter says that these animals, these animals shall be unclean for you. Among some of these were pork, shellfish, and various kinds of birds and insects, all off limits for the Jews. So a list of animals that were unclean to them. And by the way, this we're not under the Old Testament for all the things we're about to talk about, but um, some very interesting stuff commanded for the Jews in that time frame. Uh, you know, some of these things about uncleanness, some of which we study today and we realize, you know, many of the animals that were forbidden were either for unhealthy reasons or uh, they were either unhealthy to eat or it was easy to carry disease or hard to clean these animals in the ancient times. And so certainly this was because God had an infinite knowledge of his own creation and he told them what to stay away from. Later in the same chapter, the chapter discusses how touching a dead carcass of any of these unclean animals would deem them unclean. All right, you touch a dead animal, you're unclean, the Bible said in the Old Testament. Uh, the Jews would have to uh, wash with water and a special soap-like mixture we've studied before. And they would be, after touching the dead carcass, they would be unclean until evening. And again, how interesting that uh, even before the world knew about germs and diseases from dead animals and carcasses, here we see a nation of people who knew it to be unclean to touch a dead carcass washing themselves and then denoting themselves as unclean for the rest of the day for others to stay away from them. All right, don't touch that which is unclean. The scientific world didn't know about dead animals carrying uh, germs and diseases back then, but God knew what he was commanding. Leviticus chapter 13 talks about uh, how someone found with leprosy was unclean and needed to be isolated from the rest of the people. One of the most contagious diseases, probably in history, God's people were told that the person who had this disease was deemed unclean. Don't go near that person until the leprosy is found gone in that person. They are unclean. Leviticus chapter 15 deals with uh, a man who has some kind of a sexual disease when you study it, uh, where, quote, a discharge was continually running out of the man. Leviticus chapter 15 and verse 4 says, Every bed is unclean on which he who has the discharge lies, and everything on which he sits shall be unclean. And whoever touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. So really what we see here is a lot of, in these chapters, uh, physical laws of sanitation, I guess you could say, of, uh, which were really unheard of, uh, laws among the world in the ancient time period. This was unheard of for somebody to talk about this kind of stuff. The Jews were different because they had God commanding them. Verses 19 through 24 of that chapter says that woman, women would be called unclean during her monthly menstrual cycle, of which her husband was not to sleep with her during this time. That is yet another very sanitary principle. Uh, verses 16 through 18 talks about how if a man has an emission of semen, then he shall be, quote, unclean, and wash all his body in water, and he will be unclean until evening. So if semen, it also said if semen got on a garment, that garment would, was to be washed with water and was unclean until evening. So an unclean garment. So really, uh, you know, this is actually very interesting, a very interesting component of ancient scripture that the Jewish nation had to follow which helps to show the laws of sanitation and health and cleanliness is what God was showing them. So the Jews were being cautious in areas of health, uh, practicing precautions, which no other nation in the whole world was practicing at that time. Uh, this is because God gave them these laws. So notice also that God didn't give explanation for why he commanded these things. He just deemed them unclean. 
He simply uh, announced these things are unclean, but when we study these concepts today through a scientific perspective, we see that these laws were given to the Jews for very scientific reasons. Right? So uh, there are all sorts of different things labeled unclean in the Old Testament. And this was to get the Jews used to the idea of something that was despised. Something, I suppose you could use the word, disgusting, filthy, unsanitary, don't touch it. Uh, it is a thing to be rejected. Something that is unclean. Uh, you're supposed to, it's supposed to be separated from that which is holy. There was a need for purification, a washing, and sanitation. Uh, Le Leviticus chapter 10, verse 10, the priests were given the duty among the people to distinguish between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. So I ask you tonight, when we come to the New Testament, now that we're living under this covenant age, what spiritual concept do you suppose God was trying to show us through these concepts? I mean, I'm sure God is happy when his followers are wise with regards to physical health and keeping our bodies clean from germs and diseases, right? Don't go away from this lesson and stop washing your hands. Uh, but how are these laws supposed to be applied to that which is spiritual? Point number two. Let's talk about how a person can be unclean, spiritually speaking. See, in the Old Testament, God taught mankind the concept of dirtiness and need for a cleansing in physical terms so that Jesus could come and talk about mankind's real problem, which was spiritual uncleanness, defilement of the soul, not of the flesh, of the, uh, the body. So you see, God's not so much concerned about your hands being clean from germs and diseases as he is about your soul being clean from sin, spiritual defilement that comes from violations against his laws, makes you and me unclean before God. Now let's read some of the things that Jesus talked about when you come to the New Testament in Mark chapter 7, because he hits this point right on the head. And he makes this transition from physical to spiritual uncleanness. In this section, uh, we see Jesus dealing with the Pharisees who had this Old Testament physical mindset uh, talking about uncleanness. Uh, and you know, listen to what is written. Mark chapter 7 and verse 1 says, Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now, when the Pharisees uh, saw some of Jesus' disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they came from the marketplace, or when they, and when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they would receive and hold, like washing of cups, washing of pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. They'd wash everything with water. So first of all, here we see uh, the Pharisees saw a red flag when Jesus' followers did not wash their hands before they ate. And a red flag went up spiritually for them. They said, aha, you're sinning against God. Interestingly enough, uh, the Jews had even gone beyond God's laws of cleansing, and they had even started a ritualistic tradition of washing their hands in a certain way before they ate. Uh, so this was not actually even written in Scripture, the things that they were binding with these sanitation laws. Uh, but they were, they were taking this cleansing idea to a very physical extreme. Uh, they would wash their cups and their utensils and their furniture. Why? Because they didn't want to be defiled before God. And so they'd wash everything. And that was their concept of uncleanness. They wanted to wash just in case they had touched something defiled, something sinful, and uh, as they went about their daily life. And they thought that if they touched something unclean, even accidentally, uh, that if they ate with hands that had been defiled and then they ate or sat on a couch that was defiled or drank from a cup that was defiled, that they would be ingesting something into their body that God would view, that would cause God to view them as being unclean. So that was kind of their concept. But Jesus explains to this group of Pharisees down to verse 14, and he says this. He says, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There's nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. Now stop here just for a second. Jesus is saying, 
sin is not found on cups and hands. Right? That's not how a person uh, truly becomes defiled before God. That's not what we're talking about here. That was the impression that they had, but Jesus is explaining, no, you're missing the idea that God is not trying to show man, uh, you're missing the idea that God is trying to show man about true defilement. So they had a false concept. Here's true defilement. So he says, defilement does not come from ingesting sin that rests on your hands and then you're defiled. Sin is not a physical germ that sits on a surface or enters in through your mouth. All right, Jesus says, but here's the thing, the things which come out of a man, those are the things that defile him. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 18, he says, uh, do you... Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him because it does not enter into his heart, but his stomach and is eliminated, purifying all foods, right? Eating uh, with dirt on your hands is not going to bring about sin to your heart. That's not the way it works. Verse 20, and he said, what comes out of a man that defiles a man for from within out of the heart of man proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. So Jesus just laid the foundation for this discussion, uh, for what it truly means to be unclean. Do you understand what he's getting at? You know, let's see if we can break this down a little bit. Verse 21, for example, Jesus mentions adultery. Uh, followers of God read in the law that it is a violation to commit adultery. Jesus says, then let me show you what it means to be defiled. Here's the command. What is defilement? He says, what man does to become defiled before God is he begins thinking about the sin first before he does it. Where does sin start? It starts in the heart, in the mind. He lets the thought of adultery, for example, and lust enter his mind, the first, which is a temptation. And then he lets it fester in his mind and linger there. And he meditates on that evil. He thinks on it. He daydreams about it. And what Jesus points out is this evil in your heart is unclean before God. Jesus said, of course, uh, about the topic of adultery in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 28, you know, you don't have to commit the actual act of adultery to be defiled. Right? You just have to let it linger in your heart. Whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery in his heart. He's defiled because of his thoughts. Because you see, if it weren't first for your heart, it would never spill over into your actions. Jesus came to deal with the heart, the uncleanness of man's heart. So that's where all sin starts. It's within you and within me. So Jesus said, you would never commit these actual acts of murder and lewdness, theft, fornication, if it didn't start in your heart first. So man is unclean when he has a heart lingering on sin. I think that's a big part of the definition of New Testament uncleanness. You see uncleanness listed on a bunch of the sin list. It's just you're, you're defiled with many things. You, 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 you let sin uh, take over you, and you are unclean, and it's all about your heart. So if you think about sin, uh, mankind likes to lust. Mankind likes to get drunk. Mankind likes to gossip. Mankind likes to curse and swear. Mankind likes to lie, likes to view pornography. Mankind likes to fall in love with his money. Mankind loves pride and arrogance. And it's a stumbling block. But God looks down on all of our violations of his law, and it's like your soul has touched a dead carcass. That's really what it's like in God's eyes. Your soul has, be, has come into contact with something that is unclean. We could quote the second Corinthians one, do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. The idea is sin. Sin is what is tainting us when we decide to let it linger. You know, even in the Old Testament, uh, hits, hints at this idea of spiritual uncleanness. Now, there's a lot about physical uncleanness, but even in the Old Testament, listen to Isaiah chapter 64, and verse 6. Isaiah writes, But Lord, we are all like an unclean thing. 
and all our righteousness is like filthy rags. Isaiah says, God, I know you look to mankind in in comparison to your purity. And to you, we're all like dead animal carcasses on the ground. Right? Rotting, filthy. Compared to you, we are unclean. Uh, It's like the garment that we talked about in Leviticus chapter 15. They got human secretion on it. Uh, It's an unclean garment. A filthy rag, I think is a reference here. And uh, it needs a washing. It needs to be cleansed. So Isaiah says, Lord, that's us. We're filthy rags before you. And we are all like an unclean thing. And we are in desperate need for a cleansing of our souls because we're dirty. We're dirty spiritually. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, Yes, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The rest of the Bible screams in agreement. Yes, man is dirty. All humans who are old enough to sin and are capable of sinning are defiled before God and in need of a cleansing. But luckily, uh, as we mentioned earlier, we have a high priest who shed his own blood for this very purpose of our uncleanness. You see, the problem is uncleanness, but the solution is found in his blood. We sing the song, Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you over evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Or how about this one? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Point number three of this lesson Let's talk about how Christ cleanses that which is unclean. What an awesome truth that is written in our New Testament. That's really the backbone, the theme of our New Testament. Jesus walked the earth with his disciples, and they began putting their trust in him. The first group to begin following Jesus with regards to their impure souls, they put it on Jesus' behalf. And I think of uh, the awesome statement that Jesus told the 11 apostles Uh, on the night that Judas betrayed him. You remember John chapter 15, verse 3, when Jesus said, You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So he looked them in the eye and he said, You're clean. You're already clean. And they might have been thinking about that. Are we still defiled? He said, I got you covered. You are clean. You're already. Why were they clean according to this? Well, because they had followed Jesus up until this point. They followed his word, they obeyed his word, and he assured them that they were already cleansed for their trusting in him. Uh, You know, wouldn't it be so nice for Christ to look us in our eyes today in the 21st century? I think sometimes we just would like that verification for him to just look at us and say, Christians, stop worrying. You are clean. You are already clean. Your soul doesn't have a speck of defilement on it because you have contacted my blood. It has been washed. Uh, So I hope that we all have that confidence today. Uh, But perhaps you're listening tonight, maybe even online afterwards, and you say, well, you know, I've never actually heard what a person must do to be cleansed from his sins. I don't know. What do I do? Well, luckily, this question is answered in Scripture for what a person has to do to be cleansed. You know, we talk about Christ's plan of salvation for cleansing a soul at the end of every lesson up here. It's a very familiar slide. You see, a a sinner must begin by coming into contact with the message of Christ and hearing the gospel. First step is to hear. You've got to hear what you've got to do to be saved so that you can then follow it. Secondly, you must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You must believe that he was crucified for this purpose that we've been talking about to take away the sins of mankind. Thirdly, you need to repent. This is a change of mind that you must make yourself. It's your decision to repent. Determine in your heart, I do not want to chase after defiling things anymore as listed in God's laws. I'm going to do my very best to redirect my sinful life, make the best attempt to align myself with his laws. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Fourth, you need to make the great confession of faith in Christ. In Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch confessed, and he did not deny. He said, 
I do believe this. I believe this whole thing we've been talking about. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12 calls it the good confession. It is admitting your faith and your belief in Christ and his gospel. That's this step. But then lastly, the Apostle Paul had made it up to this point, to the confession, uh, as he had confessed his faith in Christ. He was sorrowful over his previous sin. I think there was a repentance there. He fully believed at this point, and yet Ananias indicated his sins had still not been washed away up through point number four. Ananias found Paul on the ground where he had been praying, uh, and after he spoke to him, he said, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22 and verse 16. The Bible teaches that baptism, preceded by faith, repentance, and confession, is where we contact the 2,000-year-old blood of Christ. Right? We didn't have access to it physically. How are we going to do it? He says it's in the waters of baptism. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 says baptism, along with repentance, remits your sins. That is the removal of your sins. Baptism for the remission of sin. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21 says this act saves you. 1 Peter 3.21. Now, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to give you a very good visual representation of this process tonight when it comes to a man's soul. Uh, so you might have been wondering well, what's up here on the table uh, to, to my left. Well, uh, the clear medium-sized cup up here in the front is the representation of your soul. Okay, that little cup right there in the front. You, uh, you know, so at the moment... Uh, it is filled with clean water, as you look. But I'm going to show you what happens when you dirty it up. This cup full of clean water can really represent a little baby who's born into this world. Right? Pure and innocent, having no sin. At some point, all of our cups were clean, just like up here. And it was clean because of our innocence. Right? No defilement, no sin, we had done nothing wrong. Not even the mental capability to comprehend being sinful. But one day, you know, probably in your teen years, maybe your early 20s, you started to be able to fully comprehend the difference between what is right and what is wrong. And you weren't innocent anymore. That's when you decided. It was your choice and it was my choice upon the age of accountability, some have called it, uh, to make yourself unclean. You defiled yourself. You knew it was wrong to tell a lie, but you told several lies. You knew it was wrong to lust after the opposite sex, but you lusted. Some were defiled through sexual activity before marriage. Others through drunkenness. Others through sins of the heart like pride. Filthy language that came out of their mouth and swearing and cursing. But one way or another, and the list of sins is long, the Bible says we each separated ourselves from God and became defiled because of our sin. Uh, I wanted a, a liquid to represent evil, uh, so I chose Dr. Pepper. <laughs> trying to make sure it doesn't all Some people drink this stuff, so I don't know why. So, <clears throat> notice how the pure water became defiled. Uh, it is now dirty. It's now a dirty soul. It is unclean. And it is true that in this state, a person cannot go and dwell with our pure and holy God. A person like that cannot go to heaven. And that was us. That was all of us. Uh, this is a visual representation of a person who is in great trouble spiritually. If you die in that state, you have no home in heaven with God, but you will not make it. I will not make it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, uh, puts, the main, or puts the problem plainly, which we read at the beginning of the lesson. Remember, no unclean person has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So that's a bad state to be in, isn't it? Because uh, the other location is hell. 
But you know, if we look on our timelines then, for most of us, you heard the gospel. You heard the plan that we just talked about and we put up on your screen. You decided to obey it. And you decided to fill your life uh, with Jesus Christ to live with him and to live like him. So the big, big uh, pitcher of water right here represents Jesus Christ. Now let me give you a visual of what happens to this dirty water when you uh, fill up on Christ, so to speak, and when you decide to obey the gospel. I'll try not to get anything on the table. Mm -hmm. I stole this from Ben, by the way. <laughs> First Peter chapter 1, verse 22 says to Christians, you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, the Bible says, Do you not know that unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 says that Christ was happy to perform this service for his church, that he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish, which means pure. Revelation 22 and verse 14 says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs, and sorcerers, and sexually immoral, and murderers, and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. Someone says, but what about someone who has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, but then allows themselves to follow after sin again? What do you do if you've been cleansed and then you sin again? All right, we're not, we're, we're not going to live the rest of our days without sinning ever again, isn't that true? So let's see what happens. So the Bible teaches that after you became a Christian, there is a need for more cleansing. Sometimes, uh, you know, we will study the book of 1 John and we'll call... We'll call it the need for continual cleansing. You need the blood of Christ just as much as you did the day you got baptized. Let's read 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. It says, This is the message which we have heard from him, and we declare it to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, but we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, you see, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, and this is written to Christians, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But don't miss verse 9. If we confess our sins, that's the word admit. If we'll admit our sins, he then is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the idea is a continual cleansing. Do you understand? 
A Christian who falls into sin again does not need to go through the process of baptism all over again. Scripture tells us to admit our wrong, repent again, have a change of mind, and pray on our behalf. That we can go to God through the mediator, right to God. Admit, repent, and pray. And if we do this, as we make the honest attempt to do what is right, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us for all of our slip-ups. Continual cleansing. Just don't give up. You just keep contact with the blood of Christ. Now let's talk about point number four. A Christian's call is to remain clean. From the day that we receive our initial cleansing at baptism, having come up out of the water, our goal is to always remain clean. Remain clean, remaining clean involves effort, it involves patience, a drastic change of lifestyle from the way you used to live before you became a Christian, and let's listen to some good verses. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 17. Here's our lifestyle. It says, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to uh, the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And the word holy, by the way, means to be undefiled by sin. Right? We can't just sin over and over and over again and keep being uh, cleansed in that state. Our God is not defiled by any sin. You work, hard, you work hard, the Bible says, not to be defiled by sin either. Be undefiled, live his laws. Verse 17 says, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay on earth in fear. Romans chapter 6 and verse 1 says, Christians, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. This version says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Do we have a different lifestyle once we're a Christian? Yes, we do. Verse 11 says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God and Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. So walking in the light that we're talking about here consists of staying away from sin, staying pure, making your very best attempt at being holy. When you fall short, you, as we talked about, admit your sin, repent, and pray. And keep at it. Don't give up. The Bible says that, that lifestyle keeps you in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ all the days of your life. You have access to a continual cleansing. If I could have set up a little mechanism that just continued to pour and pour into the cup, that would be more realistic. Once you're, as you're walking in the light, confessing your sins, it's just a continual cleansing. You stay pure. You keep it. So we just have to be righteous people and make that we must be pure. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Uh, I'd like to end on a thought that really was the thought that sparked the lesson for tonight. Uh, ben did, did a demonstration uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, that was very similar to this one with pouring. Uh, and he, he made the statement that has uh, so much important application. Ben said, what overflows out of the cup is the same stuff that is being poured into it. And read it again. What overflows out of the cup is the same stuff that is being poured in to the cup. And what a good representation of our fight to keep our souls pure throughout our daily lives and what we're allowing to fill our souls and our minds. You know, when, when I poured clean water into the cup, which represents God's goodness and his forgiveness, what spilled over the edge and into our lives? Well, clean water, cleanness, pure water. This represents time spent in God's word. You fill your mind with God's word. Uh, time spent coming here and worship. Time spent praying. Time spent uh, evangelizing and trying to teach the word to others. You're just in the word all the time. Time spent visiting the sick. And you allow God's goodness to fill your mind and your heart. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says, Think on these things. But you know, you know what if I took the whole bottle of Dr. Pepper which represents sin. And I just poured and poured and poured into that cup, and it was just overflowing. What would be overflowing from the cup is sin. 
Whatever's poured in is what comes out. So if you always surround yourself with the pleasures of sin, and instead of meditating on God's word, you watch sinful movies, you use curse words, and you listen to curse words on uh, the television, you are sexually impure, filled with pride in your heart and anger and hatred for others. If you fill up with sin, then sin is going to spill out. You know, whatever you allow to taint your mind and your heart will overflow into your life and it will affect others and it will be visible. And the Bible says you'll know them by their fruits. Luke chapter 6 and verse 45, Jesus said, A good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever's in your cup, it overflows. Which is why this was a verse I thought of initially. James chapter 1 and verse 21. It says, Christians, therefore lay aside all filthiness. And look at the phrase, overflow of wickedness. And receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. All right, listen, I do not believe that this verse only condemns tons of wickedness, as it sounds. You know, don't be overflowing with wickedness. I think it's condemning any wickedness. Right, because if you pour one drop of sin into that cup, it's going to taint your cup. And it's going to be a part of the bit that spills over the edge. All right, Christians, the Bible says, lay aside all your filthiness and any overflowing of wickedness. Don't let any drop. Get rid of it all. And receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. This is not a justification. Well, you can have a little sin in your life. It says if you have any sin, it's going to overflow. So Christians, remember, and we'll end on this. No unclean person has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So don't dabble in uncleanness. Don't be uh, willing to let one single drop into your cup willingly. Because one drop taints your cup. We must stay filled with Christ and his word. Don't let wickedness enter it or spill over the edge. And remember to admit, repent, and pray as Christians. So that's our lesson for tonight. But if you've not received the initial cleansing, you need to tap into the continual cleansing power of Jesus Christ and join his church. The Bible says you do that by hearing the gospel that we've talked about, believing it, repenting of your sins, confessing them before men, and being baptized where you contact that blood the first time, you rise up out of the water, having been washed from all your previous sins. And then, in order to remain faithful, or in order to keep contact with the blood, you just need to remain faithful in the Lord's church. So if anyone needs to do that tonight, uh, the invitation is available. And also any Christians who need uh, to make their life right, get any un uncleanness or impurities out of your life, please come while we stand and sing. Have you been to Jesus for the